Okay, so welcome everyone. So my name is indeed uh, Chris de Velder. I'm affiliated with Ghent University, uh, which is based in Ghent, Belgium. Also with IMEC, which is a, a research institute also based in Belgium. And the research group I'm part of is called ID Lab. So today I'll be talking about our work in, in the smart grid space. Uh, so I have a small team working on mainly data analytics and, and machine learning and to apply it to solve uh, problems in the smart grid. And today I'll be especially focusing on our work in respect to uh, doing some kind of demand response of EV charging. And I'll cover basically two main topics, which uh, you can infer also from the title. So which can be dumbed down to this version. So it's basically about first to get to know how electric vehicle charging sessions look like, what they look like in the real world. So about characterizing them, uh, statistically analyzing them and so on and so forth. That will be the first part of the presentation. And obviously the eventual goal is to also uh, exploit the flexibility that's inherent in that uh, charging process. And I'll be talking also in the first part about how to quantify and measure that flexibility. The second part will then zoom in on how to exploit that flexibility and that will mainly be done by a demand response algorithm using a technique of uh, reinforcement learning. But so let me get started. So the situation of the work is, as I said, in the smart grid space. And as you all know, uh, the challenges there are both in terms of uh, the changes in electricity production, which is moving gradually and increasingly towards renewables, which obviously you cannot control uh, fully. Uh, so hence the, the requirements to adapt your consumption uh, to the available production and hence the research uh, and implementation of demand side management uh, approaches. Uh, another uh, challenge aside from let's say the production side is also on the electricity consumption and there one of the challenges that are already being faced uh, include the let's say electrification of transportation. Uh, but on the same hand, or, or, or in, on the other hand rather, this electric transport uh, needs charging, so charging the batteries of the vehicles and cars in particular. And obviously this also offers some opportunities to uh, yeah, play with that demand by time shifting the chargings and hence also exploit it to address part of these challenges in adjusting the consumption to the available production. So that's uh, sort of the, the scope of the work. And as I said, I'll be zooming in on, on the EV charging uh, case today. So two parts, as I already explained. First part about characterizing uh, how people charge their cars today. And that will be based on uh, real world data sets, which we'll analyze in terms of how do these sessions look like? When do they occur? How long do they uh, last? What flexibility is in there in terms of how much time shifting can we do? Uh, and then I'll translate that time shifting uh, opportunity to flexibility potential. Uh, I'll introduce a metric uh, that we, we find in one of our papers. And I'll also illustrate if you want to exploit that flexibility, to what extent do you really uh, are pushing the system or exploiting that flexibility to the limit. And also there we'll uh, introduce two metrics that can be used to analyze, for instance, different uh, demand response approaches uh, in respect to how much of that flexibility they actually exploit. Uh, and finally, I, I'll also point to some very recent work, a paper that just got accepted today actually, uh, on simulation software or rather data generation software uh, that a student of mine worked on, uh, which can deliver uh, real world like uh, data. So that would be of, of interest for people wanting to do what if analysis or to study similar algorithms like I'll be discussing in the second part. And the second part will then be on this uh, control algorithm based on reinforcement learning. But let's get started with the first part, which is about how to characterize uh, the EV uh, behavior. So the, the work in these this slides is mainly based on the papers that you see listed here uh, currently on the screen. It's mostly work of a former PhD student of mine, uh, Nazrin. She meanwhile left the group, which is still working in the field for a commercial uh, company. Uh, you can find these references obviously also on my website. And by the way, also the presentation of today is already uh, 
available on my personal website. So if you look for my name, you'll easily find it under the talks session. And obviously also on the, the webinar page uh, after the talk, the presentation will also be shared. So there is uh, where you can have a look if you want to get into the details. So let's get started. So the aim of our work, which we started a few years ago, was to really characterize how EV charging sessions look like in the real world. And that was based on two data sets. So the very first that we mostly collected ourselves. So you can see from the dates on the slides, it's already quite a, a while ago, it was a, a, one of the first field trials here in Flanders, uh, so the northern part of Belgium, where people got to use a car for uh, about two months and then the car was transferred to another family. And the sessions, in terms of, uh, the charging sessions that they had uh, at their homes, so where they also had some charging infrastructure, were recorded as well as uh, the use of the vehicle. But yeah, today I'll be mostly focusing on these uh, charging sessions. So uh, this was, as you can see from the figures on the slide, a relatively small data sets. So about 8,500 uh, charging sessions. Number of uses was also uh, quite limited. Uh, so we then also looked for other data and uh, we got it from a Dutch organization, ELAT, which is basically a non-profit uh, research type organization that was founded by uh, Grid Utilities in the Netherlands, who proactively started rolling out charging infrastructure and obviously also recorded the data uh, to get insights specifically into how, uh, yeah, both insights in how would people use this infrastructure and actually put the infrastructure for use out there. Uh, so we got uh, a sample of their data and most of the work that I'll be pre presenting today is based on this data set, which uh, as of today is still growing. Um, so, the, so while the Belgium data set is a residential one, so it's charging at home, the uh, Dutch one, so from ELAT, is a public charging infrastructure uh, and it's basically charging stations or charging poles at public uh, roadside parkings. So mostly in urban areas where people, yeah, typically in the Netherlands, they don't have their own garage or something. So, so people use uh, these, this parking infrastructure quite intensively. So that's where we got the data from. Uh, and so one of the first things we wanted to do is basically uh, investigate yeah, when do people connect their cars to the charging pole? When do they leave? And uh, another thing of interest obviously is during that time, how much kilowatt hours uh, were they charging their cars with? This current slide uh, analyzes both data sets. So the Dutch one on the left and the Belgian one on the right. In terms of the arrival times, so the times the vehicles were connected to the pole and the departure times. So the horizontal axis indicates the arrival. Vertically, we see the departure. Obviously, you should not have any arrivals before departure. So, uh, but basically to save space, we wrapped the data around. So what you see here, the lower right, it's arrivals in the evening and departures in the morning, the next day, basically. Uh, so first thing we did is, uh, so here you see the raw data, basically all the sessions. Uh, so each point represents a single charging session, so connection and disconnection of the car to the pole. And we cluster this using a classical uh, clustering approaches, uh, the DB scan algorithm for people that might know it. Uh, and what you can see as indicated by the colors is that you, we identify basically three types of uh, charging behavior. So the first type close to the diagonal, which is the blue color, which you can see in both data sets. These are uh, relatively short sessions, meaning they're close to the diagonal, so they depart not too much longer after they have arrived. And these uh, occur mostly throughout the day, basically. So this is daytime charging with sessions of a relatively short duration. And then the other two colors, uh, so the lower right here, this, as I already explained, is arrivals in the yeah, late afternoon, night, and departures the next morning, basically. So this is basically nighttime charging, which is obviously the bulk of residential charging, so hence the we also see it in the Belgian data set, which is purely uh, residential data. Then a cluster we only observe in the Dutch case is the arrivals in the morning and departures in the uh, late afternoon. Uh, 
So this is basically daytime charging. Uh, and we learn actually from, uh, and if you look at the durations of these sessions, they typically are uh, slightly longer than a working day. And the explanation that we got uh, in hindsight from the ELAT organization is that a substantial fraction of these charging uh, stations, so the parking spots they are associated with, are in the neighborhood of uh, train stations. So this is basically people commuting to the train station, going for work and coming back at night and then driving back home. Uh, so these are, uh, and, and this daytime charging, long duration daytime charging, this was not uh, visible in the, the Belgian data set, which makes sense since that's a residential one. So this was the first step. And then further, we looked into the details. Uh, so here you see some distributions for each of those clusters. So the blue one, which is uh, the day, the shorter daytime sessions, uh, the nighttime charging and the long term uh, daytime charging on the right. And we identified yeah, what, what is the intensity of arrivals across the day? And does it differ uh, on weekends versus weekdays, which are the two colors, so blue bars indicate arrival. Uh, the intensity of arrivals on weekends, the orange bars on weekdays, and uh, nothing too much surprising. So during daytime, these uh, uh, during weekdays rather these daytime sessions, yeah, we have peaks in the mornings and evenings. So that's people, yeah, uh, during arriving or uh, basically before or after work, they also have a slight peak in the, at around noon. Uh, so that all makes sense. Obviously, in weekends we see a much smoother distribution because the time people are moving about and therefore also parking their cars is not so much associated with the working hours. Uh, nothing surprising either in the other clusters, we, we see some shifts and so on and so forth. Uh, for instance, uh, the arrival times, not unsurprisingly, charging near work or I would rather name it maybe charging near uh, train stations or something. Uh, obviously on weekends people yeah, tend to sleep in a little and so hence we see shift of the arrivals to slightly later times. The arrivals at home uh, do not change that much from weekdays from week, uh, to weekends. So this is uh, more, let's say, qualitative analysis that we did. Using this data, we then also built statistical models, looked into the distributions of uh, yeah, how uh, uh, long are people staying, so, and how, how long does the entire session last? So this is, in all of these cases, the right uh, uh, box plot. So obviously in, in the long-term sessions, you can see indeed it, it's, it is quite long. It's over 10 hours uh, nighttime charging, which uh, makes sense. Those charging near commute uh, places also quite long. And the other blue box plot, it's uh, the distribution of the idle time. So it's basically of the entire session the duration, how long was the car parked there and connected to the station but was not charging. So obviously the difference between those two numbers is then the time that the car was actually charging. But the idle time basically represents sort of the flexibility time window over which you could shift the charging, which by the way, in the data that we collected uh, happened in an uncontrolled fashion, meaning that as soon as cars arrived, they started charging up until the point that either they left or the battery was fully charged. And we, in the data that we have, we also have the, uh, the recording of the power profile, and therefore we can infer the total kilowatt hours that was charged over the session. So, but for, from this analysis alone, you can already see, especially in those long-term sessions, uh, the duration of the charging, it's only uh, in the order of uh, three hours, uh, between three and four hours on average, out of a, 10 plus hour session. So you do have indeed a quite big time window over which you can play with uh, moving the charging around. So this was just an overview qualitatively of the data. If you go into the papers associated with this analysis, you will also find statistical models uh, that we proposed uh, fitting the data and that you could uh, use to generate data. And as I already indicated uh, very recently, we actually just released Python code that does exactly that, can generate artificial sessions which reflect uh, the data the models were trained on, which is in our case, the ELAT data. Uh, but so after characterizing this, uh, what we were interested most in was rather trying to yeah, quantify the flexibility 
the potential in there. Uh, so you see again a reference of a paper of yeah, about four years ago uh, where we proposed yeah, a metric that can uh, be used to quantify that flexibility. Uh, which is summarized on this slide. So what we try to do, we, we define this flexible power that is available at a given time t, which is the, the first parameter here, and that you can sustainably uh, consume or choose not to consume over a certain horizon delta. So that's the, so if p flex is a certain, uh, has a certain value, it means that you can choose over duration, starting from the point t, for duration of delta, you can choose to consume that power or not to consume that power. Uh, and we calculated this based on the EV sessions. So what this metric then says at a given time, it will tell you, considering that the EV sessions, yeah, you can consume this amount of power for, let's say, the next horizon of delta being 15 minutes, for instance, you can consume for instance, yeah, a few uh, kilowatts or a few megawatts, depending on, on the number of charging stations that you're considering. Uh, so that's what we calculated. Uh, and the way we calculated is summarized here. So obviously the sessions that contribute to this power have to include this entire time interval. The charging has to be uh, at least uh, the, to cover this delta and also the idle time. So the, the time you can delay the charging also has to be at least delta so that you can choose not to consume that power. And uh, so basically for each time of day we calculate and for varying time horizons delta, we calculated for the various uh, charging uh, session types, how much power we can play with at that given time of day. And this basically leads to this, these kinds of uh, curves. So from top to bottom, we see the three uh, tidal sessions and left is weekdays, right is weekends. So the top here, it's this blue, this blue cluster from the very first uh, figure, uh, which basically is uh, the shorter sessions uh, over, oh, over time. Uh, so we see that yeah, you can have, a, so, yeah, uh, I don't remember actually the number of charging stations we considered. But yeah, it's mostly the shape uh, that is uh, of interest here, I think, qualitatively speaking. Uh, so, so what these curves mean, yeah, for instance, if we go to this point, which is for the near home, so the charging, the residential charging, nighttime charging, if you look at this point in the curve, it says that at 7 a.m. we can, uh, we have volume of 750 uh, kilowatts for X uh, stations. Uh, and if you look at the color of the curve, so if you look at the red curve here, it means that yeah, we have 700 kilowatts that we can play with. We can choose to consume or not to consume uh, for 15 minutes. So it gives you an idea of what is the power volume you can flexibly offer at that given point in time. Obviously, if you increase the horizon, so if you want to be sure that you can consume a certain amount of power for a longer time window, so if you go from 15 to uh, minutes to basically four hours, obviously these curves drop. And the thing is that yeah, for these long-term sessions, since you have a lot of flexibility, the, the drop is only happening uh, slowly. Well, obviously for the shorter sessions, this drop is uh, moving more uh, fast. And again, you see the same thing. Obviously the residential scenario of, has this flexibility mostly at night because it's nighttime uh, sessions those short-lived sessions over the day obviously happen during the day. And another thing that you can see is that, uh, which basically confirms that this uh, third cluster, which we only saw in the Dutch data set, is work-related, is commute-related, is because the volume of those, uh, the flexibility of the flexible power from those sessions is way bigger on weekdays than uh, for weekends. So that sort of uh, confirms our hypothesis that it's, these are sessions that are related to uh, work uh, commutes. Uh, so, so that's one way you can quantify, let's say, the potential flexibility. Uh, so that's a metric you can use uh, and that can be, give, give you some insights uh, as to what power is available at a given time of day to flexibly play with. Uh, but then obviously, uh, you would eventually exploit that flexibility. And the next question we ask ourselves is, yeah, what if you do exploit that flexibility, 
uh, which seems to be relatively abundant from our previous analysis, do you really need all of that to, to cover uh, some uh, demand response scenarios? So the, uh, one study thereof, uh, can, you can find in, in the paper that's listed here. Again, you can easily download it from our website. Uh, so, but how do we quantify the flexibility that we exploit? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so, so I'll, I'll discuss that in, in, in a second, but let me first uh, try to explain what we are trying to quantify. Uh, so this is a fairly complex graph, so maybe let's just focus on the middle part. Uh, what you see here, so the, the lines, which I've put in a bolder thickness, the blue line here, it's the business as usual load. That means if you don't, do not control any charging, and cars would be just charging uh, uh, upon arrival and so on and so forth. The power profile over the over a week, basically, that's what this graph is showing, uh, would look like this blue line. So you have two peaks in the morning and the evening, uh, uh, volume in between uh, during midday, let's say, and, and a low power consumption at night. Uh, now, obviously, the, this peak behavior is something a grid operator uh, would like uh, to uh, reduce, or even if you're ex uh, exploiting, let's say, a large-scale parking, uh, to limit yeah, the capacity of your connection, what you would want to do is basically yeah, sort of cut these peaks and do basically load flattening. So, and actually, if you look at the flexibility in the sessions uh, that yeah, are now uh, resulting in this blue line. If you sort of play around with the flexibility in there and shift some uh, charging in time, what you can do is you can indeed almost reach a flat line, which is this uh, green line here. And obviously to do that, you need to defer some sessions or part of charging in those ch sessions. And this is what these colors, uh, the, 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 the color fills here indicate. So to go from this blue line to the green line, you need to shift some of the consumption of up to one hour. Uh, other charging needs a little longer, but you can see that yeah, a substantial fraction is indeed relatively short shifts. At some points in the day, you do need lar larger shifts. So that is what this uh, graph already suggests. Other cases that you would want to look at is instead of load flattening, another objective could be to adjust your consumption to uh, re um, renewable uh, energy generation. And, and then the same thing uh, would apply, but instead of reaching a flat line, you would want to follow basically a profile yeah, which is sketched here, that this purple line and the orange line is the result of trying to mimic the same behavior by shifting your cars, uh, your uh, charging basically. So this is what we want to quantify. And now the question arises, yeah, Obviously from this graph, it's, it's quite complex to come to uh, yeah, summarize this in a, in a single figure. So to do that, what we defined is, is actually two metrics that together give you an idea of to what extent you exploit your flexibility potential. Uh, and there's two sort of dimensions uh, in which we quantify this exploitation. One is on the energy level, so of the full charging energy, so the kilowatt hours that you need to, your car to be charged with, how much of those did you shift around? Uh, so that's what uh, this E-flex measure uh, defines. So it's formally listed, defined here, but basically, it, so it's a metric between zero and one. Uh, for instance, if it amounts to 0 0.2, that means that 20% of the charging volume, so the kilowatt hours that, that you can shift around, to only 20% thereof is actually shifted around to reach your uh, demand response objective. Uh, then, so, so that's about the energy volume that you shift around. The other dimension that is of interest, obviously, is how much time-wise did you shift that around? And that's exactly what we measure or capture in this second metric, which is the uh, T-flex, so the, the time flexibility that, or the exploited time flexibility. Again, it's a metric which uh, is confined to an interval between zero and one. Uh, and it basically says, for instance, let's just go straight to the example. 
if it amounts to 0 0.8, that means that you, the end, the fi final part of the charging, which could be uh, yeah, distributed between the start and a certain point, the final charging, so the time at which the complete charging was finished, ends at 80% of your uh, flexibility time window. So if you have an idle time of 10, 10 hours, it means that only two hours prior to the end of the session, you basically ended the charging. So the higher these metrics are, uh, the more uh, flexibility you exploit. So what we did is then basically calculate these, calculate these metrics for the two cases that were illustrated on the previous slide. So one with the objective of load flattening and the other one uh, in renewable balancing. And these are the results for, for the sessions that are, or the session types that are uh, introduced previously. So again, from top to bottom, the top row is, uh, are those two metrics. So blue is T-flex, orange is E-flex. Uh, for sessions uh, near home, so it is the nighttime sessions. Uh, and we plot them, uh, we plot those metrics uh, basically uh, for the sessions given their arrival time. So that's the x-axis. So obviously you have a, a, a gap here uh, because you don't have arrivals at night and so on and so forth. So, but the bottom line or, or what you can conclude from this uh, graph is uh, for both cases. So full lines are the load flattening case, uh, dashed lines are the balancing case. But if you look at all of the graphs for, for the three uh, session types, basically, uh, you see that the steeflex oftentimes goes to one or very close. So it means that the final part of your charging is pretty much towards the end of your session, which, which may sound like bad news for a consumer uh, who might be anxious that, yeah, what if I need to leave early? And then uh, if I see figures like this, that means that if I unexpectedly would leave earlier, my car will not be charged. But unfortunately, uh, that's not the case uh, because if you look at the orange uh, curves here, which is the E-flex, only a fraction, in this case of, yeah, let's say, 25% of your uh, total charge volume, so in kilowatt hours, actually gets pushed out of the time window uh, in the business as usual case, which is charge as fast as possible upon arrival. So it's only, so your car, if you leave earlier, basically the conclusion here is that if you leave earlier, indeed the charging may not be completed. Uh, fully, but it, uh, there will be only a very minor fraction uh, left to charge. So, so that gives some confidence uh, towards the user that yeah, he, he will probably still be able to cover the required uh, trip, uh, even though his battery is not fully charged. Obviously, in some sessions, especially the shorter ones, which have less uh, flexibility, yeah, as soon as you do exploit something, yeah, the, this E-flex yeah, raises above 50%, so that's not unexpected. But for the longer sessions, this E-flex uh, really stays relatively low. So the good news basically for, from, from this kind of analysis is that uh, the flexibility that is present, yeah, in case we want to do one of those objectives at least, uh, largely suffices to reach those excess, uh, objectives without excessively pushing the flexibility or exploiting the flexibility to the limit. That's basically, let's say, the high level message of this slide. Okay, so that's uh, basically it uh, for the first part. Uh, so, so let me try to wrap up. The goal here was to get insight in uh, real world data sessions, uh, charging sessions, to quantify them, to build models, uh, and, and to do some yeah, qualitative uh, analysis thereof. Uh, and the details of that you can find in the papers that I cited. So, and, and just to give an example, for instance, of this uh, flexible power quantification, what we can do or lessons that we use in the local projects is based on the iMove data, which is this uh, Belgian data set, residential charging only. You can calculate things like, yeah, what if 3% of the fleet in Flanders is electrified? What uh, kind of flexible power does this mean at what at a certain point in time, for instance, noon and weekends, if you do the numbers based on our session data, it means that you have seven megawatts to play with that you can sort of either consume or not consume in the next two hours. So this, this kind of what if analysis or, or answer to this kind of questions is what switch analysis can bring. Uh, and and yeah, just as a reminder, uh, as I said earlier, 
if you're interested in real world data, yeah, you might have found that it's, it's sometimes often hard to get by. Uh, also uh, for this ELA data, it's not, let's say, publicly available, although they are typically open for academic uh, collaborations. Uh, so very recently, uh, in, in, and it's detailed in the papers that are listed here, we have, or, or my student rather, Manu has built a Python code that can generate sessions, so generate lists of arrival times, departure times, and the charging volume, volume that is uh, realistic in the sense that it reflects the characteristics of uh, the ELA data. And uh, the last paper on the slide, uh, which you can actually also find the latest draft on, on my webpage, uh, details how exactly which models we use to do to, uh, to do that and uh, the github link is also provided here uh, so yeah if you're interested in this obviously uh, feel free to get in touch with me as well so that was the first part about getting to know the sessions and then uh, the second part let me just do a time check okay uh, the second part is about the control algorithm that we worked on so that's work of uh, Nasrin again and uh, saw some recent updates from Manu uh, both, so the journal paper, uh, sort of the full details, and then Manu worked on improving uh, the originally proposed uh, algorithm by Nazrin, and that was a conference paper of uh, last fall, basically. Uh, both of them, again, can be found on my website. Okay, so what are we trying to do here? So the case that we are focused on in, 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 uh, with our current work, it's, it's the first step, so it's definitely not finished. Uh, but so the first case in terms of objective of what do we want to try to do uh, or how in what sense do we want to control the EV charging process, the objective that we strive for was to basically flatten the load. So if you would have a profile, a load profile from charging, like on the left hand side, which uh, then shows the power from noon Monday to noon the next, uh, this is a case of residential charging. What you would expect to see is that you have yeah, a load increase on in the evening because people are coming home and doing, uh, they're basically starting to charge their car there. And uh, as time goes by, as night goes by, most of the cars get uh, fully charged and therefore the load drops. What we want to do uh, basically is uh, have this peaked consumption transfer format to uh, as fat as possible. Uh, line. So ideally it would be a flat line, obviously, depending on the flexibility that is present, we can we get reasonably close, but probably not exactly the same. And the way to do it, obviously, is to uh, shift the charging in time. Uh, like I said, other objectives could also include balancing renewable sources, or if you look to distribution grids, uh, you might, the grid operators might be interested in, in sort of uh, more power issues like uh, minimize or, or limit voltage variations. Uh, so these things, uh, just to be clear, is not some, some objectives we already studied, but that could be other scenarios we might work on in the future. The current work that I'll be presenting is load flattening, or that's the objective at least. So what is the scenario or how can we de define the problem? So what does our EV charging coordinator, which we're trying to develop here, what does it need to do? Uh, well, basically the assumption is that we, uh, if car, when cars arrive or when they are connected, what we assume to know is their state of charge or at least how much more charging they would need. Uh, so the amount of charging uh, they still need of those two connected cars, that's something we assume to know. Obviously we also know past cars, but yeah, they are no longer in the system, so we cannot do anything else. From those uh, cars that are in the system, aside from the amount of charging, so the kilowatt hours they need to be supplied with. Apart from that, what we also assume to know is the time they will leave. So we do expect to know upfront or upon arrival at what time they will disconnect and so by what time this amount of charging will need to have happened. What the system does not know, know in advance is future arrivals. So for instance, if uh, later, yeah, let's say one time slot from now, this Ford car would arrive, the system does not, not, get, does not know that uh, upfront. So there's no prediction, uh, explicit prediction at least, of such future arrivals. So the inputs available is, yeah, this, the cars that are in the system, how much uh, charging they still require and how long they will be there for. And then this charging coordinator basically has to figure out, yeah, when should I be charging what, what car that is currently in the system? And the objective is, yeah, this is, with 
for this picture, this would be the business as usual scenario, meaning cars start charging up on arrival. Uh, what we want is basically convert this kind of line, uh, which might be peaked at certain points, to a flat line, which is as low as possible. That's the objective of our coordination algorithm. Now, how do we do this? Like I already uh, said in the beginning, we're applying uh, reinforcement learning. So one, the first thing we need to do is yeah, for reinforcement learning model is basically to characterize the state of the system. And the, the system is in this case, the, the cars connected to our start, uh, charging station. So what we uh, know is yeah, when they arrive, we get to know how long they will be there and how much charging they will require. And the charging is basically expressed in kilowatt hours in our case. So we, uh, in, in this, this is sort of a simplified assumption, uh, which basically amounts to that the charging rate uh, of all stations is, and all cars therefore is the same. So uh, there's a, the charging power is limited and known. Uh, so, and if that's the assumption, there's only two things we need to know of all the cars that are still present in the system. It's the time they will still be there and the time they still require uh, charging, which you can easily calculate if you assume uh, the, the charging rate fixed from the kilowatt hours that they need. So, uh, but obviously uh, the, the, the goal of our approach is also to be scalable. Uh, we want the approach to be applicable to yeah, situations with yeah, many, many uh, charging stations. So an entire public uh, parking space, for instance, should be manageable by this algorithm. So let's say tens, hundreds, uh, maybe thousands uh, of, of charging stations should be coverable. And that's why we, we thought of how can we sort of compact this list of uh, yeah, depart, uh, time till departure and uh, time till charging to charge which here scales with the number of vehicles and therefore the number of stations. How can we sort of uh, make this more compact? Uh, and, and this is the representation, the state representation uh, we came up with. So basically we uh, assume a slotted operation of our system, first of all, and then we basically count how many cars have, will still be there for one time slot and need one time slot of uh, charging. Uh, this cell will indicate that yeah, these are the cars that are still there for two time slots, only require one time slot of charging and so on and so forth. So basically cars on the diagonal are those that will need yeah, continuous charging up until the time they are leaving because there's no flexibility. Obviously we don't want any car to be in the lower diagonal because it me would mean that they will need more charging than they have time left. Uh, and so the further you're away from this diagonal, so if you move towards the upper right, the more flexibility you have. So we uh, summarize the state and yeah, obviously it will also, uh, the appropriate action to take will obviously be time dependent. As we've seen that at night time, there's very few arrivals. We have some peaks in the mornings and the evenings, uh, at noon and so on and so forth, depending whether it's weekday or weekend and so on and so forth. So definitely the time will also be uh, a required element of our state representation. And then on, uh, but then the next uh, item is this matrix, which basically represents the uh, amount of cars uh, present in the system. And as you can see here, we normalize it towards the, to the system capacity. So it means that, uh, so in the simple case with just two stations to explain the concept, uh, we divide basically the counts by the total number of uh, charging stations here. So that's why there's this 0 0.5. So we have 50% of our cars in this bin and the other 50 in, in that bin. And a bin, as I said, is associated with a certain amount of time slots that the car will be still in the system and a certain amount of time slots that the car needs charging. So that's how we represent the state. So based on that state, what the system or coordination algorithm needs to figure out is yeah, given the state of the system, which you can actually uh, summarize in a vector by just doing the counts, the summation over these diagonals and the parallels to the diagonals, because these are, so the cells with a single color in this slide basically uh, represent cars that have the same flexibility, the same uh, amount, yeah, uh, amount of, uh, the same difference basically between the requested charging and the time they're still there. 
And out of fairness, we would indeed want to treat those cars the same. That was our reasoning. So hence, we can further compact the state to a vector by taking the sums over these diagonals. So, uh, and again, we uh, would eventually uh, also normalize it to the system capacity. And then the actions to take, basically what the algorithm has to decide on is for each of those elements in uh, this state factor, it has to uh, decide how many cars from that state or what, uh, which fraction of those cars should be charged. So that is what the action uh, represents. So in this case, if we have two cars, uh, only in the system, so two charging stations, uh, there's three things we could do. We could either charge none of them. So then we, for all of the cells, the decision would be do not charge. Uh, we, we, he, for the middle cell, we could either charge one of the two cars. So it's 50% of them, or we can, could charge both. Uh, and so then the action would be zero, one, zero. Uh, so, so I hope that's more or less clear. Uh, so, so this is given a state, what are the possible actions? And here you see the, the full possibility of uh, action sequences over time, assuming yeah, we have those two cars initially in the system and no other cars arrived. Uh, these are all possible decisions you can take. So the green parts are these action vectors. These matrices are the state representation, uh, as I explained. And then this uh, other part of the state is obviously the time, which goes from top to bottom, from one to times of one, two, three, and so on and so forth. Obviously, some uh, decisions will not satisfy the charging requirements. So if you decide not to charge cars uh, that do not have any flexibility left, for instance, in this case, we have this one car here on the diagonal. If we choose not to charge it, it means that yeah, it will have an unmet charging request. So the dashed states and actions are basically actions we should avoid. Uh, and, and this can actually be uh, removed for, from the possible decisions. So what we do then is we train a self, we, what our uh, reinforcement learning algorithm needs to do is given this uh, given state, it has to yeah, learn the function of mapping the state representation to the appropriate action. And what you do is basically you sample possible decision trajectories, for instance, like this sequence uh, that is indicated by this blue line, uh, and you calculate uh, a certain, yeah, cost, which in our case would be, for instance, yeah, the, the square of the power summed over the time, uh, which obviously if you minimize this, you try to flatten your load uh, and you basically calculate it and try to take those actions with lead, which lead to the minimal cost. That is the general idea of the reinforcement learning approach. So I'll not go into further technical details because uh, it may be a bit too complicated if you're interested, the details are in the paper, but that's, I hope at least the concept is clear. Uh, so let me then maybe move to the results, uh, I mean, the questions we try to answer uh, using this approach and, and to validate yeah, whether it works, how well does it work and so on and so forth. Uh, so for the experimental evaluation, uh, what we did is we took uh, a limited number of charging stations from our ELAT data set. So the most busy ones, we, we, we used the rivals for the top 10 in one case and another case from the top 50 stations. Uh, from a certain year. We, as you can see, we worked with time slots uh, that were quite large and you could say unrealistically large. So instead of maybe uh, the 15 minutes that you would expect, we used time slots of two hours. And this was basically just to keep the computation, uh, computations limited, uh, have a, yeah, a smaller uh, yeah, state space and so on and so forth. Uh, because our main uh, goal of this experiment well, was not to develop a practice yeah, uh, uh, or train an algorithm that we could directly uh, deploy in practice, but rather yeah, does the concept make sense? Does it work? Does it not work? Yeah. What are the parameters to tune? Uh, do they matter much? And so on and so forth. Uh, so what I'll be showing next is, is, is some costs for different settings of our algorithm. And the cost will be, uh, as I already hinted, will be the squared power summed over the time slots. So obviously the higher this is, uh, the, the, the worse. And uh, at least if your objective is indeed load flat. Uh, and the cost, I will not be plotting the absolute numbers, but uh, to judge how well the system performs, we, we basically have two limiting uh, yeah, boundaries, let's say. Uh, 
and one thing we considered is as like sort of an ideal gold standard benchmark. The, the ideal case is a sort of an Oracle uh, decision. And for this Oracle decision, that basically means what is the best you could have done if you would have known everything uh, in advance. And everything then also means if you would have known all future arrivals and if you optimize uh, knowing uh, all arrivals up front, what is, let's say, the flattest low profile you could get to? Uh, we calculate the cost thereof, uh, or we then calculate the cost of our algorithm relative to, to that, the ideal world case uh, that knows it all, which is obviously uh, not realistic either because you can never exactly perfectly know all future arrivals, but at least you, it gives you an idea of how close to that ideal solution you're getting. And obviously the other case uh, we'll be comparing our solution with is the business as usual scenario, which is basically a charge upon arrival. So that's sort of the dumb charging or uh, case uh, that we compare against as well. Uh, okay, so th this is the type of graphs that we see here. And, and we asked a few questions. Yeah, one uh, question just from the methodological point of view, uh, in these uh, self-learning uh, algorithm cases, you know, one one question obviously is yeah how much training data, how much example data uh, does your algorithm need to learn from to be able to perform well? Uh, so what we did here, we offer yeah we basically used charging sessions of what over one month, over three months, over five months, seven months, and so on and so forth. So longer and longer periods, and then tested. Uh, I think for the, the month following that period. So what you can see here is that yeah, you indeed from just a, the, month, the prior month, learning from that alone uh, does not lead to the best results, but you don't need overly large uh, training data sets as basically what you see here. Um, so yeah, maybe I should have said this. So the, the vertical axis is this relative cost to this Oracle benchmark. Uh, so that's one parameter is, yeah, how long should your training period be? And then the other question is, if you remember this tree that I dr uh, have drawn for, for the simple case, if you consider a certain day of, of data and you want to simulate possible actions of charging, not charging at a certain given point in time, uh, you, you will be sampling basically from this uh, decision tree of all possible uh, decisions. You will not exhaustively uh, roll out all possible uh, decision sequences, because that obviously will explode. You would be sampling from that tree. And this axis here uh, represents the number of sampled trajectories for a single day you take from that training data. Uh, and this is basically the same data, but uh, plotted differently. So here we group by number of samples per day, and then we, the uh, x-axis is the training months. So the conclusion from this is for our particular case, yeah, with three months and 5,000 trajectories per day, we have uh, sufficient uh, training to do the best we can based on this kind of training data. So that's a relatively uh, technical question. Maybe more of interest is uh, uh, this one. So how does our RL algorithm compare to both the business usual scenarios? So, so what is your cost reduction? It's quite substantial as you can see here. Uh, and it also, Obviously, we do not get to the optimum uh, decision uh, because yeah, there's still unknowns in our case, uh, but the difference is not too big. Uh, and as an aside, in, in Manu's latest paper of uh, the conference paper of last fall, he also compared our uh, reinforcement learning approach with a heuristic that basically for each session individually spreads out the charging over time. So basically, alternates charging, not charging, to reach a sort of uh, as uniform as possible charging profile. Uh, and our uh, reinforcement learning approach, which basically coordinates all sessions together, as opposed to this heuristic, which only uses knowledge from one session at a time to decide what to do for that particular session, we see that we do reach, uh, do attain a substantial savings. Um, and this is basically a graphical representation of, of that same information, but yeah, for tests over uh, different months of the year. So the, the lines that you can see here, the green line is obviously the, the optimal policy. So it's this normalized cost. So it's one, obviously. Uh, 
Uh, the red line is a business as usual scenario, and you can see that yeah, for one month compared to the other, the, this is yeah, always quite a bit higher than the green line, but at some months it's even higher than at others. So that means basically there's uh, more flexibility, for instance, in these months. So, so uh, the reduction that you can reach from business as usual to the best is higher. So it means that you can play with the data more, or uh, at least to exploit it better to reach this uh, flat load line. And this is uh, our uh, reinforcement learning uh, approach in between uh, for two different uh, training data periods, basically, which is for given months, the either one month or five months before. And this is, the bottom line is basically just the difference between those uh, two things, relatively speaking. Uh, but yeah, what you can learn from this is indeed, yeah, you get reasonably close uh, to the optimal. So it does seem to work more or less. Uh, and that's what we want to see confirmed. Uh, and then the final uh, interesting question, I think, is, uh, as I explained, the, the state representation that we conceived, the aim thereof was it was that uh, it was sort of scale free in the sense that the, since we normalize by the number of sec uh, sessions, uh, or the stations rather, uh, our decision uh, output, so, so the action uh, to be taken was also relatively to the, expressed to that capacity. And the, I, the underlying idea, or our hope at least, was if we train uh, on a system with a smaller number of stations, the learned uh, policy, so the learned action to take, since it is expressed scale-free, we can apply that policy also to a larger system because you can normalize its state in the same dimension. So all numbers normalize between zero and one, even though the, the system is bigger. Uh, and what we validated is, uh, or what we wanted to validate is if you train on a smaller scale system and then scale up the system to larger sizes, but still respecting the same arrival uh, yeah, intensities and basically distributions of uh, the arrivals over the day. The hope was that this policy learned from the small scale system would still do reasonably well. And this is what we validated here. So what we see here is the effect of a reinforcement learned policy, which we fix once it learned, but then we applied it to a system which has two times as many stations, three times up to 10 times as many stations. And we, uh, Assuming arrivals, yeah, each arrival in a scaled up system, uh, each original arrival in the original system and the scaled up system, which then be multiplied with the same factor. So we would distribute, or if we have a single arrival in a single time slot uh, in the small scale system and we scale it up five times, it means that there would be five arrivals in that same interval in the scaled up system, uh, sort of uniformly spread uh, across that interval basically. Uh, so what we validated here is basically, uh, or what this shows is that, uh, again, for different uh, training uh, trajectory sizes here, if you scale up the system, yeah, the performance does go down a bit, meaning that the cost goes slightly up if we scale up, but it stays relatively stable. So this idea of using this uh, sort of scale-free state representation and action representation does seem to work. Uh, that is what this slide basically suggests. Okay, that was the last question we, we tried to answer in our experimental study applying that reinforcement learning technique. Uh, so let me maybe summarize and then wrap up because I think uh, also time-wise I've uh, exploited the time allotted. So uh, the, the goal or the message I wanted to convey is that, that uh, basically reinforcement learning uh, is a viable approach to solve or uh, joint coordination of uh, uh, multiple uh, charging stations uh, based on real world data. Uh, that's what we try to validate. Uh, and it has, uh, reinforcement learning has some uh, advantages. It's, it's a data-driven technique, so you don't need to uh, build an explicit model of arrivals and so on and so forth. You can just feed the data and have the other learn from it. Uh, and, and the other strong point of our uh, solution, I think, is that it jointly controls uh, an aggregate of charging stations in a, with a scale-free, basically, uh, state and action representation. 
Uh, but obviously it's only a first study uh, as you've seen some of the assumptions for instance to the time slots are, are not that realistic yet so we need to refine and, and work further to validate that it still works uh, on this yeah, more realistic settings of time slots for instance and there's also st some other ideas uh, that are more technical uh, in terms of reinforcement learning approaches uh, and then obviously uh, uh, also in terms of objectives rather than load flattening we could also be looking to other uh, objectives okay so uh, i think time's up so i'll stop here and i'll be happy to take questions great thank you chris i'm planning to spend the next 10 15 minutes uh, for q a so i encourage the participants to leave questions in the chat box meanwhile i'd like to congratulate you on uh, the paper being accepted today yeah, yeah, thanks the pre-publication uh, is already available on your website? Oh. Yes, it is. I just uploaded it uh, this afternoon. So, Excellent. And uh, it is correct what you said. It's very hard to find um, electric vehicle data. Mm -hmm. So uh, how have you managed to make data available? Or is it that... Well, the, the thing is that, well, indeed, uh, uh, yeah, since publishing our reinforcement learning paper, especially, we, we received many questions and yeah, even also just the analytic paper. Many people contacted us to get the data from ELAT, uh, but also yeah, with the GDPR, the data as we received it, we can, it's not shareable. Uh, so what we needed to do then was basically point people to, to get in touch with ELADs. And fortunately, they are quite open, at least to academic, uh, academics, to collaborate and share the data under an NDA. Uh, but what we did now uh, with, with our model, the thing is that we are not sharing the actual data, but rather outputs of a model built on that data. And so we release a trained model, which doesn't yeah, give you access to the data itself, but allows you to synthetic generate data which uh, mimics the real world data. Excellent. And that's available on the And just as a side, so if you do have your own data, um, we not only release the trained models but also the tools to train a model from another data set and obviously in, in a certain format but yeah nothing too, too tricky or too special. So if you do happen to have your own data you can see build your own models yeah, using our assumptions obviously i mean the models are validated that they are a good fit for the ELA data they may or may not be uh, for your own but yeah at least you can build similar models and, and generate similar data uh, based on yeah, other data sets or sub sub parts of the data sets and so on so thank you before i take some of the more technical questions are you able to give us an overview of what is reinforcement learning? How does it fit in the machine learning world? And how come you chose reinforcement learning paradigm to solve this question of EV charging? Uh, well, the basic idea of reinforcement learning, um, yeah, I don't have a slide, but I'll try to just orally uh, explain it as clear as possible. Basically, what you need is uh, you need to have yeah, some yeah, model or, or system that you can interact with what you need to do is you have to i mean the, the basically as i explained for our case the idea is that you decide on how to represent state so which basically formally mathematically or in a few numbers describes your system uh, and then the the policy yeah and in our case the action so the system is yeah the ev stations and we for what we want to do is train basically a function that gets as input the current state and decides the actions to take, which in our case is decide which uh, vehicles or which charging stations to supply power to. Um, the way this, this policy is learned uh, is obviously you have to say what is a good or a bad action. So it basically learns from this feedback. So what you do is at first it, the, the, the system has no clue. So you get a certain sta uh, uh, state and you basically take a random action, but then you get feedback in terms, it can be two things, either it's a reward or a cost. In our case, it's a cost. And if it's cost, it means that the higher the number, the, the worse you're doing. And then they, uh, over you, you, basically let the system take random actions, but you record the reward and the system sort of remembers from that reward, okay, this was a good or a bad action. 
And from experience, basically, uh, the algorithm learns that these, under this given state, this is a good action or this is a bad action from experience. Uh, and that's basically, in a nutshell, the, the core ID. Uh, and that's basically also what we did. The technicalities of, uh, uh, I don't know whether this is sufficiently clear to, to get at least the principle across. So basically it, it means that if you want to apply it, you, uh, and there's two, actually two ways, either you deploy it online and you really take the action, see what happens and learn over time. In our case, what we are doing, it's a sort of a batch mode reinforcement learning. Uh, and what it means, and then instead of yeah, directly in practice, or just have the system learn over time, uh, you can imagine that if you would just let it learn from the actual sessions that would be happening in the real world, you would have yeah, relatively few sessions per day. So it would take a very long time to learn what is the good thing to do here. Uh, what we did is using a batch mode, uh, sort of an offline training of the algorithm by generating possible action sequences and uh, calculating the cost. Uh, so by exploring basically, like I said, randomly take actions from this full decision tree, like I've drawn it, you basically simulate possible actions you, and you feed the system with all this sort of synthetically generated experience. Uh, and, and obviously that goes way faster than just putting the learning system out there and let it learn only from the actual real world sessions. So what you need in, in this case, it, it is either a model that can supply uh, yeah, possible yeah, data in terms of generation uh, session arrivals rather. Uh, so that's not typically the issue, but also uh, yeah, evaluate possible actions and to yeah, simulate possible actions. And in our case, uh, in the case of, of, of this EV charging, you can easily sort of generate possible actions, calculate your costs, and then feed those numbers to the system. Uh, basically feed the state, the action, and the corresponding cost over time. That's uh, in a nutshell uh, how it works. I hope Thank that's sufficient, sufficiently clear. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'll start taking some of the questions. Mm -hmm. Is how robust is the charging algorithm to deviations and arriving and leaving times? Um, good question. Well, how robust? Uh, there's no easy way to satisfy, but uh, as you can imagine from also what I just explained, obviously, if you train you train the algorithm with yeah, certain arrival patterns. Uh, and obviously the assumption is that yeah, you feed the system with sort of all possible situations that can happen over time. If the data that you feed is sort of yeah, biased in one way or another and, and certain things that will happen in practice are not fed to the algorithm, it has little or no clue of, of the correct actions on, on, on under those conditions. So the robustness is sort of implicitly guaranteed as long as the training data that you su supply is representative of what you uh, will encounter in practice. So that's one thing, uh, but that means also that in practice, and, and that's something we, we have not investigated, but it would actually be quite interesting, I think. Uh, as you can imagine, this, this real world data set that we do have from ELAD, it obviously evolves over time. The, the study that we did now and the data we fed to it was for one year where the number uh, for a constant number of charging stations and over that year the, the arrivals are yeah, more or less uh, let's say stationary they do not evolve over time if you would and, and in practice over the years at least you would expect yeah, that behaviors of people might change so how you would cope with this is that obviously you will not be uh, you would not uh, train the system once and for all and no, never touch it again. So, so what you would do uh, uh, is typically you would retrain periodically, daily, weekly, depending on how fast your arrival patterns would change. Uh, you would basically retrain the algorithm, let's say maybe every week, uh, based on the past two, three months. 
uh, that's that's why we looked also into yeah what is the appropriate training uh, data time frame uh, and you basically retrain uh, yeah over time and, and deploy the updated policy afterwards and as long as as, as the data or the arrival patterns would not change drastically over time uh, this sort of uh, would mean it, it, it should be should be performing well uh, one aside from that uh, I mean it's a, it's important obviously to also incorporate yeah things that you do know uh, in terms of let's say for instance a weekday versus a weekend we saw that it's quite different uh, so it, it would make sense to also include that kind of information in your state representation and also if you know let's say next tuesday is a whole a bank holiday it would probably not be performing as a usual uh, tuesday so you could choose to have different models for different day types and activate the correct one depending on yeah, the knowledge that you have of the day type this is one possibility for instance to, to make sure that indeed your actions that you're taking are the appropriate ones for, for the, the situation at hand thank you uh how flexible are the algorithms? I'm trying here to take two questions maybe at the same time. Mm -hmm. One of them is asking, uh, should there be another variable to account if certain cars want to leave before they are fully charged? And the other question is asking about, uh, can the algorithm take into account the variable cost where someone is willing to pay more for charging? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think in principle that this could be dealt with. Uh, but yeah, in essence, it, it's, I think it, it would boil down to, yeah, for instance, if you want to differentiate between different types of customers, it means that, yeah, you would have to also classify the sessions in, in, in those two categories. So you would need to refine the state representation so that you sort of, yeah, for both categories, you, you take the separate counts so that your algorithm has this information. In terms of the people leaving earlier or later, uh, so, so I guess that sort of depends on, on yeah, or, or that, that refers to our assumption that we know exactly when a car is leaving. Uh, what in practice, I think, yeah, you could also, uh, yeah, there the, is different ways you you could work with to cope with uncertainty on, on that level. Uh, one thing is that, that uh, let me think, yeah, you could try to predict that or, or to be, yeah, to, I mean, the, the easy way out obviously would be to build in a safety margin. And if, if people are saying, I, I'll be leaving at four o'clock, maybe just aim, and if you're historically data, I mean, if you collect the real world data in those cases, you would also see to what extent people adhere to what they say they will do. Uh, and yeah, there's one easy solution, I think, would be to yeah, monitor the data and, and try to establish, yeah, if people say they will be staying for four hours, uh, yeah, if maybe yeah, there's a substantial fraction of people that leaves earlier, try to, for instance, figure out, yeah, maybe three, it means that at least 90% of these people will stay for three hours, then you could work with yeah, just subtracting, yeah, adjusting the target deadline let's say uh, by this information that would be one way out uh, another thing is, is, is to try and, and uh, yeah you could also actually uh, yeah for the system you could actually also feed the data to the algorithm by adding some let's say deviations from the uh, yeah, announced time of departure by yeah, drawing samples from a distribution that really represents what people do in practice and if you would sort of yeah generate the departure at the time they were actually departing by drawing samples from that departure and distribution rather than yeah, believing what they're saying yeah. i think your system uh, might learn the, to do the right thing as well uh on that point, one of the questions is how useful it is to have access to real-time data via telematics. Uh, I assume that that means telematics, so, so it means that... So if you wanted to read it, it's a question from Charlie, so it's yeah. would 
seeing how much demand the required energy for you is, there is in real time be useful. For example, by keeping a running total of kilowatt hours depth for connected EVs and mapping this with geolocation data to enhance the prediction. Yes, I'm trying to locate the question, but yeah. Obviously, yeah, the, the more information, you, uh, yeah. Trying to learn this kind of information rather than asking people for it, because I think to some extent that is, is what that boils down to. Yeah. That obviously is a is a very useful direction, eh? uh, but uh, but where we we didn't go that way yet because we first obviously wanted to see, assuming that you do know it exactly, yeah, does it work well enough? And next steps indeed would be going into direction of yeah, what level of uncertainty or deviations from this announced time or sort of noise in the actual behavior with respect to the announced time uh, can you tolerate? And yeah, whatever measurement sensor data or, or also in terms of yeah, prediction of future arrivals by lead in, yeah, looking at traffic patterns in the neighborhood of the charging stations, uh, sort of the business of the roads would probably be in a quite good indicator of, of yeah, if you look at a parking garage, for instance, what, what amount of arrivals to expect. Uh, so obviously, yeah, the, the more information that you can supply that would allow your system to learn this better uh, I think makes sense uh, or could make sense, but it also depends on, on yeah, how predictable or how good you can predict those future things uh, based on, on the situation up until now. But yeah, I, I do believe that adding yeah, more sensor data to replace the, the data, model, yeah, to enhance the model makes sense and or to, to yeah, reduce the need for manual input of, of information from people. Yeah, basically. and do you have right now the capacity of the battery in state of charge? Uh, well, the, the, no, in the, in the data, for instance, it's, it's not, not present. Uh, and, but that's obviously yeah, sort of a, a, at least the required charging volume. Uh, so the kilowatt hours that need to be charged uh, till the battery is complete, then that's one thing we assume uh, to know, so that would indeed mean in practice that you get access to the state of charge and also uh, get to know the uh, battery capacity. Yeah? How did you determine the amount of energy required then to charge the EV before? Well, because the, the sessions that we have, so the session data that we got from, from ELAT, uh, aside from the arrivals and the departure, we also have, uh, I don't remember, I think it's on a five minute basis, the amount of uh, power consumed. So it's charging upon arrival basically. So we have the, the power levels and, and obviously from this power, if you integrate this over time, you have the kilowatt hours that have been charged. So that's what we considered as a charging demand. So in, in cases where this drops to zero, yeah, you can reasonably assume that the battery was full by that time. And so, so this was our charging capacity. If it charges continuously from yeah, start till end, yeah, you do not know whether the full capacity was reached, but anyway, that's the maximum volume that could be consumed and there's no flexibility in those sessions. So that's the information we got. We, we know the kilowatt hours consumed during uh, that session. And that's what we uh, use as our charging requirement. In practice, I mean, you could go, uh, yeah, you could argue that, yeah, Possibly, at least in, in, in some cases, the, the charging level that you reach, the full battery capacity, is not always what, I mean, it could be and, and often will be quite a bit larger than the, the energy required to, for the people to take the next trip. So if you could even yeah, be exploit yeah, or reduce or uh, the charging of play with it more basically and be more flexible, uh, if you would have also the, let's say the next trip data uh, to be sure that you charge at least the, uh, the volume to cover that next trip. And that could mean that in some cases you could yeah, use less than what is now present in our session data. But we, we didn't look into that uh, yet because it's, it's even harder to get by that kind of data, obviously. Thank you. We have some questions on the time step. So you mentioned in the presentation it was two hours. We have one question on if you reduce it to one hour, uh, would that double the computation time? And the other question from Anurag is, uh, uh, in case it is real-time learning, what is the time step do you think is feasible for the learning? 
i.e. how frequently do we make the model learn? Um, yeah. Honestly, I don't remember on top of my head, but I, I think in, in this conference paper of Manu, uh, he did list the computation times. Let me see if I can quickly look at it. I think it was, but yeah, there was only, I think for the situation with 10 charging stations, uh, it was, well, this time, yeah, it was less than an hour, I think. Do you expect if we use uh, more? Um... But yeah, I would need to look into, yeah. Uh, Okay. The training time, I, I, right, I, yeah. yeah, it will probably scale more or less linear, I, I, but yeah, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to say yes, it will double if you have the, the resolution, because it, yeah, it also depends on the number of samples you take, and yeah, I'm not sure whether, yeah, the required and, number of, of sample trajectories in this decision tree might also need to uh, go up or down uh, with, with finer time scales. So, so it's, it's a question that is hard to answer for me all. Yeah. yeah, no problem. I suppose people can have a look at the papers and yeah, yeah, sure. have more questions. But it's a definitely a reasonable question. But yeah, but like I said, uh, we did take these, these large time slots for now because we want to uh, train systems uh, under many different assumptions as you've seen. Uh, within reasonable time. So now I think it took yeah, maybe an hour or at least um, not too much more than that for a single case. But yeah, we wanted to play with various parameters and, and all of these combinations. So yeah, to keep the experiment to work for the entire paper <laughs> limited, uh, that, that's why we, we went there. But yeah, obviously the next step is indeed to, to validate that uh, it still works within a reasonable time if you go to resolutions of um, let's say maybe 15 minutes and then that's i think a more practical uh, uh, were, were you using a normal laptop for this yeah i think yeah, it was just a single machine i i'm yeah nazarin for sure just used her laptop i think yeah or yeah, a cluster of just uh, pcs yeah. i don't think she used gpus or anything okay um, last question related to maybe real world applications of the models. So, uh, will it work with um, electric vehicles of different manufacturers of different capacities and energy requirements? That's one side of the question. And the other, uh, how far are we to actually seeing implemented by actual aggregators? Do you have any industrial links? Uh, well, so for now, the, the, the work in detail was purely simulation, but the good news is that we'll be starting uh, two European projects uh, this fall. And the idea is indeed to deploy this uh, with uh, commercial partners, uh, at least on limited scale. So it will not be thousands of stations, but at least a uh, yeah, order of 10 or something. Uh, the, the, the goal is indeed to deploy that uh, in practice, but yeah, this, this is future work uh, that's being and The intelligence would be running on a, let's say, central entity, and that sends the commands to the individual. Electric. Yeah, it will be, I mean, I think, yeah, we'll, we'll be doing the training offline and then just deploy it uh, on the, the real system, the, the, the learn policy. Uh, with electric vehicles of different battery capacities. Uh, yes, yes, yes. But then, then yeah, but that, that's something we need to indeed think about and uh, figure out how to, because um, the other question was asking, yeah, do you assume access to the state of charge uh, and things like this? So, so we'll, I think we might uh, need some yeah, tricks, <laughs> so to speak, uh, because uh, current systems of communicating with the car may or may not be uh, divulging that kind of information. Eh? So. That is something we'll need to figure out uh, in practice. So, so there's indeed uh, still quite a few practical hurdles uh, to be taken, but yeah, we hope to be taking them uh, pretty soon. Do you compare the work uh, with some of the commercial aggregators who are doing similar things? Uh, it's, it's a new field, so of course there is a lot of people who we want a lot of people to do to answer these questions. I just wondered if you're comparing your work with... Yeah, for, for now, no. Eh? So, so the, the papers are just, yeah, we, we devised these baselines. Uh, yeah, so, so the obvious one, let's say the business as usual, and then the uh, ideal world, uh, all-knowing uh, optimum. Uh, but also this, this is actually also the reason for, for this heuristic, because it's uh, demanding, on, uh, it's, it's sort of an obvious thing to do. It doesn't require too much uh, 
intelligence and it's already doing quite something so that's a benchmark but to answer your question uh, no we have not compared to other approaches yet but the as i said in these european projects we'll be working with uh, commercial parties and so we'll be indeed comparing our approach to to what they uh, are currently developing uh, even if it's only in prototypes great great thank you so much for your time uh, is no, there no you'd like to add no, for, for me it's fine. It's been a nice experience. Uh, I hope it's been useful to all of the entities. Of course it is. Thank you so much. Yeah. We'll make the video available online. As, as you mentioned, your slides are already available on your website. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Bye. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. See you.